This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Simon Phipps and I talk again, because we had him on just a few months ago with Greg Croa Hartman, who is the highest level you could get being a kernel maintainer and is behind so much stuff that we're doing. We talk about Europe. We talk about open source. We talk about controversies. We talk about lots of stuff we didn't last time. And it's a really cool show. And that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 732. Recorded Wednesday, May 17th, 2023. Update your kernels. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Fastmail. Reclaim your privacy, boost productivity, and make email yours with Fastmail. Try it now free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. Hello again, everyone, everywhere. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly, and I am joined this week by Simon Phipps himself from his bunker in uh, in the office of the week uh, in somewhere in the UK. <laughs> One of the Hamptons. <laughs> I, I'm 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 just watching as the video zooms past me in front of me. Hi, Doc. I'm I'm in my upstairs office. I can see the sky out there and trees, and uh, and I decide I, you can see I'm I'm you went uh, <laughs> I'm on the edge today. So you're on the edge the, today. We the, were seeing the le- I have the grey leopard print, and um, I'm it's, all ready it, for whatever, really whatever the world It makes you look others. like makes you look like parts of four people as well as you know invisible. <laughs> Your invisibility cloak for the for the for the spies of the world. We want to get going in a hurry this morning. So our guest is Greg Crow Hartman. Did you listen to the last show by any chance? I did um, not. <laughs> Greg did not. <laughs> I was asking Simon actually. Oh, sorry. So we'll just <laughs> we'll just go ahead and bring Greg in. <laughs> let's have, let's, let's bring Greg in. Yep. <laughs> sorry. That's all right. So sure talking those who don't know, I mean, Greg is. An alpha uh, Linux kernel developer, actually a major Linux kernel developer, because alpha is to suggest as something else. Um, uh, he's been a kernel maintainer for the stable branch, the staging subsystem, driver core, debugs, uh, many, many other things. And uh, he was on here a few months ago when the world was very different. <laughs> so we're having him back. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me again. And you and Simon are only one time zone apart right now i guess we are yeah, yeah. this side of the pond it's <laughs> nice over here all is good i'm going to be in uh, in his continent or island next week so it's all good it's right it's a subcontinent so I, it's still... and i'm going over to brussels next week so you'll probably miss me oh so we'll uh, switch yeah <laughs> yeah you're, you're both in 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 europe <laughs> it's funny we we move around a lot and i'm in the thing that is technically our home but when our son was younger he would refer to the second home as alt home and the next one after that is alt shift home <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so i feel that it's like that a little uh, th- this way here so so how are you doing greg you're i'm you're, doing good almost yeah. good a little jet lagged i was in korea last week so yeah almost and you good. said uh you just released seven whatever uh that, that's six <laughs> seven kernels i did yeah a little over lunchtime today so um yeah it's <laughs> How but like I said, it? it's a joke. It's, that's just a Wednesday for me, so it's all good. Well, let me, so what I mentioned to some people is having it back on the show. Um, I actually had uh, Dave Tat here last night, who huh. you know he's an instrumental in network everything. He debugged this network, and then it didn't work this morning, and he's not here. <laughs> so we got it working again. But he he wanted to ask a lot of things about embedded, and of course he's not here to do that either. I'm wondering how. You know this clock over here, or the that appliance, or that thing on Mars. Do they get updates, or are they just done? Are they frozen in place? Uh, I, I don't actually know. Is, can they you generalize about updates. this at all? They should get updates. And, and in fact, there's a new law in the EU that's coming out for all these mobile devices that run Linux or anything run, or anything have to get updates. Um, they have to get security updates. They have to stay alive for I think it's five years past when they were bought. Uh, when they're offered to be sold, when they're bought. So current oh, companies have to update them. <laughs> it's actually going to be the law, so it'll be it'll well, be interesting to see. Um, so I, I, I was be, be, I've been watching the uh, amendments coming through this week, Greg, 
And no, this uh, is a different I'm one. Thinking, no, that was oh, this last. Is, this one's just, already this passed. Is, all right, do you have to go about NIST two? This is the mobile one, and the mobile one passed right, last right. year, and it's going into implementation. Yeah, we're see. I'd love to talk about CRA. That's different, probably. Why you're going to Brussels? Yes. <laughs> but mobile devices have to be kept alive for a certain point in time. So yep. they will have to update their kernel. They're going to have to move to a new kernel revision because we're not supporting long-term kernels for as long as they wanted to. But the joke about these kernels being supported for six years or so is it turns out nobody updates them. So I've been yep. keeping some of these kernels alive for six years and nobody uses them. And I know nobody uses them because when they break accidentally, nobody tells me. Um, so kind of a mean little thing. Um, I was in Korea last week talking to some I, a company there that uses Linux and lots of things and trying to help them figure out how to do more updates in a better way. But um, IoT, all I mean, my washing machine runs Linux. Uh, my, my power meter runs Linux. All those guys, they all should be getting updates. And they do need to get updates because the world changes. And that's the thing. If they're sitting in a little box and they don't interact with the world, sure, don't update them. But if the world changes, you need to keep your kernels up to date. Do, do you, um, is that a gating factor when you go hunting for appliances? I mean, are you, are you looking? <laughs> no, it's just random. Like, again, I bought, I bought a washing machine that happened to run Linux. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> so, um, it's just everywhere. I can't get away from it. Um, it's just kind of funny. It's in every, it's in my car. Um, I mean, these are not things I go out and hunt for. All the TV, I mean, some things you cannot get away from. All the TVs in the world. They all run Linux. Um, <laughs> Back channel. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan asked, did, do you jailbreak your appliances? <laughs> is, no, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't want that. Um, some things that are fun, but I mean, I also just like using them for what they're supposed to be used for. So no, it's fine. I have, I use Linux on my own kernels on my, some of my devices. That's about it. Um, but yeah, putting my, I've run my own kernels on phones. It's no fun, but it can be fun. <laughs> Some phones, I mean, I'll call out Pixel 6 runs Linus's kernel tree plus a bunch of patches, which is really good. It's been kept up to date for the past two or three years. So it will run mainline kernels, which is cool. So you can, there are devices out there that can run the latest kernel. But there's some something, I was talking to one company that um, supports devices for 20 years. And they talked about it in a way of... Um, you're keeping these alive for 20 years, but it's not like once you sell them, they're frozen in time. Every year they update the kernel, they update the thing because these are alive living things. And maybe at the year 18 or 19, then they say, okay, we're gonna stop, stop updates. And we'll just do only tiny maintenance stuff. But it's a lifespan of a device. And that's part of the device and how they keep it alive and maintenance and understanding about that. And that's good, you want that. <laughs> so. Mm. Um, so yeah, all your wind turbines, they're all running Linux. I mean, so you want those kernels mm. updated. <laughs> yeah. So how, yeah. How, how do you feel about that, Greg? You know, the idea of legislate, legislating to say that people have to update. Because, you know, as I've been dealing with the CRA, I've got quite a lot of impact from uh, input from community members that they feel that they should make the decision about whether they update rather than it being a, a part of a regulation. Do you think it's smart to regulate updates like that? Well, all they're saying is, if you look at the updates for CRA is a little different, but like the mobile one is you have to provide security updates for the lifetime of the product and the lifetime of the product is going to be five years. So you can't just run away. Right. And that's good. That's, I mean, I think that's a good thing. How those vendors provide the lifetime of updates is up to them. Now I will claim and I've proven that you can't provide a secure kernel unless you're using the stable kernel releases. We have loads of documentation to back that up, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to, by virtue of keeping a secure device, you have to take these updates. Otherwise, there's no other way. The CRA has a lot of other really weird things. My best one was you can't ship a device with any known vulnerabilities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who is the known, <laughs> right? Known to me? <laughs> known to you? Are you going to just put your head in the sand and not to listen to anybody? And then you're like, I don't know of any problems. So it's all good with me. Um, the CRA has lots and lots of issues. Um, that is very interesting, and I've been involved in that a little bit. Um, right. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting you point that one out, because I, I actually think that the open source community is having an impact on the CRA, because I've seen this week's uh, amendments from the ITRI committee, and uh, in particular, the, the, the point you just made about saying, you know, not shipping known vul anything with known vul vulnerabilities, uh, the, the, the text has been amended in the current proposal. 
and uh, it well, I says saw, known, I mean, I saw 300 known to the manufacturer. Tell us what the CRA is in the first place, for those who don't know, and the whatever it was committee as well, okay. <laughs> just so we have our acronyms right. So, so the CRA is the Cyber Resilience Act. It's a, a, an act of the European Parliament that's going through on the, a fast track. It will be law by the end of this year. And it basically in, makes sure that manufacturers of network connected devices uh, have a responsibility for at least five years to... Um, provide secure updates and to only ship secure versions of their products. And it achieves it's that. It's a little bit more than that. But it, yeah. it, it, <laughs> it achieves that by using a, by CE marking the product. And there's a, then a load of, uh, there's a load of conditions and variants that d relate to things like whether your product has a function that's critical to the functioning of society, which gives you more responsibilities. Um, uh, uh, the, the, whether or not you're, you are a developer of open source software, uh, there is an exception in there that exclude, theoretically excludes open source software. Um, and so, so the act is basically about making sure that manufacturers of, uh, network connected devices with, with software in them take responsibility for their products in the market and, uh, and they will end up with liability for them as well. So the product liability directive in Europe is being updated to attach massive liabilities to people who fail to ship secure products. Did you f fix that up, Greg? What, what, what did I get wrong? <laughs> no, that's good. That, that's, but I mean, think of it as this way. The nice way is the there's rules about shipping a toy, whether it's harmful or not, right? You wanna make sure any device with electronics in it that's connected to the network is also not harmful. So it's, that is the goal. Um, they try and carve out open source in some weird ways. I don't really want an exception for open source. I don't think we need an exception. I think open source should stand on its own, but there is some way that they're trying to check liability onto the individual developers of open source rather than the liabilities on the person who ships a product. And that's yeah. where some issues are involved. And then like, so I'll call out Orange, the big um, phone company in um, France for saying specifically that we're willing to take the liability of the, all the software that, and the device that we ship don't push it onto these random other people that had nothing to do with the device we made, even though they wrote parts of the software. So that's, that's I, the I, goal. That I, is nice I, of them. You know, the, yeah. the guy who wrote the bill assures me that he didn't intend the developers to pick up the liability. Um, I agree. And, and it's written that they say they don't intend, but then if you read the words. It, yes. <laughs> uh, there's kind of friendly fire casualties that result in some of the other effects cool. that are in there. I mean, so it's I don't hard, think I, hard writing rules. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it isn't about uh, having an open source exception. It's about saying that uh, they should be regulating the software in the market, not the software in development. And Correct. making would, that true in that the, in the out language right. of the act is really hard. Yes, I, I would like that to have. It doesn't. But there's also some other things that everybody keeps forgetting about, like the vulnerability issue stuff and um, like known vulnerabilities. Well, known by whom? and known for how long. And then there's other rules about length of time and, and all this stuff that, and then, oh, all, Europe is going to spin up its own version of Mitra to collect vulnerabilities and hoard them and dole them out to people. And it's, there's some really, really scary things about that. I mean, yeah. for the kernel, I can't tell you if there's, if I'm fixing security bugs or not legally, I can't, yeah. because if I tell one person, I got to tell everybody, right? So just say, update your kernels. <laughs> So um, that's going to be very interesting as it goes on. And hopefully, I mean, you say the latest version, the latest, I saw a version yesterday that had 350 pages of proposed yep. changes to the amendments. So <laughs> there's a lot still in play here. Yep, yep. So I, I mean, I get, I have in the lucky position that, so I, I'm representing OSI and dealing with okay. the legislators directly on this. And, and I'm lucky enough to get like a 177 page document every two days which I have to go through and read and find out what changed because there's no... I think I'm on that mailing list now too. I got that Yeah, yesterday. I think you are as well. <laughs> yes. I skipped the meeting. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, I, there's actually a good news story here, which is that I think that for the first time that I remember, we're actually having an impact. You know, I saw words that I'd written in response to one of the legislators in the last set of amendments. Uh, good. You know, I've That's seen good. I've seen people uh, f from the committee offices uh, wanting to have their language checked by somebody who understands open source so they don't make mistakes. So I think we're having a real impact here. And I think this is the next stage in the maturity of open source and of Linux of 
uh, you know, we've, I'd be very afraid we're finally important enough to be regulated by Parliament. And I'm, I'm not sure we're really <laughs> quite ready for that yet. Well, all software should be regulated by Parliament. I mean, it, I don't think Linux is, should be special here. There's nothing special about us. If you want to use Linux for your devices, yes, follow these rules. If you want to use any software for your devices, yes, follow these rules. I don't want to carve out. I just want us to play on the same level playing field. Don't hurt us more. With some of these ways that it is written, it's going to hurt us more. And that's, I know it's not their intent, but it's the way it's written. So, um, if it works out, that's great. And um, hopefully the big the big issue is um, this is going to hurt companies a lot and companies aren't really aware. I mean, the interesting thing is like, look what the rules say for microcontrollers, um, AMD and Intel, anything that has microcode in it, that's covered. And that's going to be very, very interesting how those guys deal with that. Because that's software. Software's in your chips. <laughs> So, so now, I mean, there's another dimension to all this that, you know, when you when you become essential to the economy, uh, you also have to begin to deal in geopolitics. And I saw the Linux kernel mailing list rejecting a patch from Baikal Electronics recently, which is a, a Russian um, company that uses the Linux kernel. Do you want to talk us through the, the logic behind rejecting that patch from Baikal Electronics? Well, first off, Nobody can force any other maintainer to take a change. That's just by rule. So it's not against our code of conduct. I can reject a change anything for any reason I want to. I don't have to reject it in a rude way. That's against our code of conduct. But I can reject anything because once I accept a change from you, I am now responsible for it. If I don't feel comfortable taking a change, I won't take it. Right. Um, so the person, the company in play here is a company that only works for a certain for the Russian government defense industry. And they were adding support for a specific piece of hardware that they create and use. And the maintainer who of that subsystem was uncomfortable in taking that and didn't want to take it. And so he didn't. And Linus backed him up. And the company and then there was a private email thread. The company knows the issues involved. Linus explained them very well and discussed it over with him and asked the company for the specific details, but Generally, you can't force us to take a change if we don't want to. Right. Um, that's as much as it comes down to, as far as that goes. So, so, so um, I've rejected extent, patches that, for much worse. <laughs> so. So, so to what extent is that a matter of the of personal taste on the part of the developer? And to what extent is that a matter of uh, the Linux Foundation being subject to export controls by the U.S. government? It is nothing to do with export controls. Nothing at all. There are no export controls with regards to the um, US government, with regards to open source. It, it's treated as a publication, um, just like when Chinese companies were banned before. Um, they had their work in closed um, specification committees where they had to sign contracts removed, but open source contributions and open source interactions are all covered under the open laws of publication and academia. So those are not covered, it, we're not covered by um, any type of that. This is purely a personal decision. Um, again, we make personal decisions not to take changes all the time. Um, you have to, kernel development and development in general is a personal interaction. I have to trust that you're going to be around to fix the problem when you get it wrong. Um, so if I don't trust that you're necessarily going to be around or I don't trust your motives are good, I don't have to take your change. And you can persuade me otherwise, which is great. And I encourage you to do so, but it's at a person, everything we do is at a personal level. Um, this had nothing to do with governments. Per se. Uh, so, you know, personally, I completely support the the uh, the decision that uh, that uh, Yakub made there, and I would encourage all of your maintainers to make the same decision every time. Personally, uh, but do you think but we, we also can get take away patches with... from other? We take patches yeah. from Russian people all the time that we know are Russian. So it's not like we're banning people from the country by any means. I yeah, took some yeah. the other day. So um, it's an individual. But, I mean, this, I support is, Jacob this company is a. And, this company is a very specific case who, you know, it's, it, it's, it's entirely reasonable, I think, to have concerns. But the question I was going to ask is, how long do you think you're going to be able to get away with it remaining a personal decision if governments are going to start regulating what you can do with regard to uh, defect resolution? So they can't regulate what we do. They can only regulate what people use our devices for, right? <laughs> so... Think about it that way. So defect resolution, um, 
it'd be interesting that if you're going to discuss how we have to meet certain guidelines and whatnot, that if a company wants to use Linux, they're going to have to support that. So take a specific example, like software bill of materials. Um, under the rule, the CRA is devices have to ship a software bill of materials that contain a list of everything that they have in it. Wonderful thing. I've had companies come to me and say, there's no way we can possibly do this. We ship too much software. We don't know what we're doing. I'm like, that sounds like a management problem. <laughs> um, you need to get a hold of that. You need to figure that out. And they're like, well, we need the community to provide software bill of materials. I'm like, no, you are the community. Do this work and provide it. Just give us a, give us a SPDX line. Give us a software bill of materials and stuff. So just contribute and in a way that meets your requirements. If your requirements now are these new engineering rules, these new directives by different governments, provide the work to do that. If you want to use Linux, nobody's forcing you to use Linux. You use Linux because it's free and it meets your needs. <laughs> That's why you use yeah, Linux. Yeah, okay. Because, you know, I've got this, I've got this uh, instinct in my bones that uh, it's going to get more tricky than that over, over time. You can already... I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you, but we <laughs> only accept. So I'll say one thing, like the Linux kernel security team cannot sign any legal agreements. We can't get into any con thing like that because we all contribute on our individual merit independent of anybody we work for. We are not covered under any employment agreements. We can't, no employer can tell us what to do or have access to what we do. So that is an individual thing. So no company can tell the Linux kernel security team what to do per se. Um, that being said, I have been subpoenaed by the US government <laughs> and had to talk to the Senate about things, but they are agree with how we do things. So we're okay with that. <laughs> Well, I'm sure I, the Dutch I, government will talk to me soon because they're right across the street. <laughs> There's more to cover around um, around what's happening in Europe and how that's driving the world, at least politically and to some degree technically. But we'll get to that. But first, I let, have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Fastmail. Make email work for you with Fastmail. Customize your workflow with colors, custom swipes, night mode, and more. Fastmail now has quick settings from the quick settings menu, so you can easily choose a new theme, switch between light mode and dark mode, and change your text size without leaving the Fastmail screen you're looking at. Quick settings will also offer options related to the Fastmail screen you're viewing. You can generate a new masked email address, show or hide your reading pane, switch between folders and labels, and more. Choose to auto-save contacts or choose to show public images of senders from external services like Gravatar. Set default reminders of events, change how invitations are handled, or turn notifications for calendar alerts on and off. Now add or buy a domain through Fastmail and they will set all the records up for you so it works immediately. Fastmail gives you the ability to send and receive emails from your own domain and manage multiple email addresses in one space, which helps keep you organized and protects your personal data. For over 20 years, Fastmail has been a leader in email privacy. The Fastmail team believes in working for the customers as people to be cared for, not products to be exploited. Advertisers are left out, putting you at the center. You pay for free email with your privacy. At Fastmail, your data stays yours with better productivity features for as little as $3 a month. Fastmail has better spam filters and absolutely no ads. And privacy isn't all you get with Fastmail. Superior productivity tools with scheduled send, snooze, folders, labels, search bar, etc. Plus keep track of all the important details in your life easily with Fastmail's powerful sidebar. Works with password managers like Bitwarden and 1Password to make it easy for you to create unique passwords for every account and safely store them on your device. It is great on desktop and mobile, especially when you download the Fastmail app to get the most out of your email. It's easy to download your old data and import it to your new Fastmail inbox. Fastmail is moving email forward with new internet standards and open source innovations that power many email services other than their own. Don't get left behind by substandard email providers. Reclaim your privacy and boost productivity with Fastmail. Try it now, free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. That's fastmail.com slash twit. So there's a, um, 
we could talk about AI for hours, I suppose, because that's the big, I mean, you were only here like a few months ago, Craig, and, and, and uh, it's like AI has, has, there's always a topic. I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, uh, Don Norman, who wrote things that make us smart and design of everyday things and stuff like that. He, he, he once told me that, um, that there's always a subject that is a black hole, meaning if you bring it up, the event horizon of the topic exceeds the dimensions of the room and all conversation falls into it and no light escapes. And I feel like AI is sort of that right now. But as long as we're on Europe, um, there's a story that the EU has this um, AI Act already, an amended, act, an, an amended act. And by the way, the U.S. House is meeting today on on. Uh, AI and there is it's actually live if you want to <laughs> leave here and go there I don't recommend it but I got a note about that earlier um, but it, it said that this will have a significant impact on open source and I'm wondering um, if you're paying attention to that or if that matters to you much well I mean AI is just pattern matching I, I just made a bunch of people real mad by saying that <laughs> <laughs> um, statistics at a higher level um but I mean, why like is AI, I mean, again, pattern matching somehow special and resolved from data collection laws, which is why the EU is put their new thing or privacy issues or copyright laws or fair act of derivative works and fair use act. Why are they somehow special? And they're not, they should be follow what is all the same other rules and laws that we have. I mean, AI, again, fuzzy logic, my, my rice cooker 20 years ago did that, right? That's just the same idea. <laughs> um, you could do it at much more things and you have semi sane ways of summarizing stuff, but, and it works great for translators. But yeah, I mean, we, we've been using it for kernel stable work for, I don't know, a decade now. Has anybody noticed? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so wait, wait, um, wait, wait. It, it solves a good, it solves a problem for some things. Yeah. When you're using it, what are you using? I mean, you're said pattern matching or statistics at so, a higher level. Which when we great pull when we have a stable, way. so Linus has a development tree, right? We add patches, nine changes an hour to that, and then we backport fixes to the, from that tree to our stable trees. Um, a lot of those changes are marked by developers saying this needs to be backported, right? Some whole subsystems and some people forget to mark those. Some don't even want to participate, so they don't. So uh, researcher Julia Lul um, in Paris came up with the idea of how do we take the body of work of these are known fixes for the kernel that developers have said these these should be backported and apply that to everything and see how they match up. And she had a research student go off and do that. They wrote some good papers. Sasha, um, who works with the stable, me, we do the stable work together, took that on, refined it and refined it and refined it some more. So now he runs these pattern matching logic. Basically, it's AI stuff on the kernel. and. Um, Fix out all the patches that look like they need the other fixes and manually reviews them, sends them off for other people to review and we add it. But we've been doing that for a long time. So again, I mean, they solve it's fuzzy logic match, say fuzzy matching, right? Um, they solve good problems that way, but we're not immune from an algorithm being, why should it not follow the same rules of data collection, fair use, copyright, et cetera, et cetera. And I think when people somehow think that this, this idea of the day can ignore all the laws is very dangerous for all sorts of other reasons because we live in a society by which we all need to follow these rules, right? So, so I'm I'm wondering. I, I I love this um, statistics at a higher level panel pattern matching, um, and so, but there are lots of people out there, really reputable people, important people. You will know Harari. He is quoted by everybody. This is the end of the world. There we would generative AI becomes general AI becomes our overlords and the matrix comes true. And, and there's always this logical gap between it's all going to end and how it happens because how it happens is never described. <laughs> and does any of this concern you at all? Where I'm going with this though, is I, I love that you pointed out that the kernel is run by people. <laughs> it's individuals. It's a collection of individuals is not, um, beyond that an organization it's a commons of a sort but it's it's remarkably human in how it works and so i want to tease out in general i mean not just here um what is it that can, that can only be human that can never be pattern matching by a higher statistically adept machine 
I, I don't know. I mean, this is what philosophers have been discussing for decades or centuries, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not a philosophy major. I know there's people. I are. was, can't help okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so then, I mean, you, you have the rights. I mean, you have the, the discussion of what is the consciousness and what isn't the consciousness and, and all those discussions of what makes human, a man, person not human and the soul and all those things. I'm not going to answer that. I'll say from a technical point of view, if you look at technology, it's cool. It does statistical pattern matching. Is it a hot dog or not? Is it a tank or not? I mean, those type of things. And then applying those patterns to other things that a human asks it to do, right? Um, like, I would love for uh, I mean, code autocomplete based on current patterns, but somebody has to write the code in the first place to be the autocompletion to do that. I mean, if you look at the chat GP stuff, they they just scraped the web. They scraped my, my domain, Linux.com also and stuff. And if you feed it thing questions based on articles I've written, it'll spit back those answers. Wonderful. That's a great summary. Think of it as a Wikipedia index, right? Um, but I mean, that's a, somebody had to create the summary in the first place. Who's going to make the new stuff from that is going to be the interesting point. Everything's a remix. Yes, that's what art is. But can it make the next logical step to do things in a way? I mean, they've messed with certain things they can do procedural generation of antennas, right? Maybe you can do that for art. I don't know. Somebody has to say, is this good or bad art? I don't know. But again, that's a philosophy argument. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg, just to switch away that subject from you, um, <laughs> I, I, I know that you're, sit, you're sitting in a place where you're seeing a lot of uh, inputs and changes and trends because of the Linux kernel is at the center of everything. So uh, where should we be looking for the next big deal after the digital agenda wave in Europe and the, uh, uh, the, the, the wave of AI use of software? What's the next thing that has caught your attention for where we're going to have to be concerned about a societal impact? After all, oh, I mean... I, Linus always gets asked, and I get asked, what's going to be, what's in the next kernel? I mean, I don't know. It's when it, well, all our job is to make the hardware all these crazy people come up with work, right? So you, we're giving you the hammer and you make the thing with that. Um, that being said, we see hardware coming. I mean, we've seen hardware that's in the process for a long time. So more, pro more chips, different processors, risk five everywhere. Um, we see the low level stuff that's going, um, faster memory buses, memory buses that span cabinets and span things like that. Um, giant number of CPUs compressing down to tiny ones. So you have more logic, but I mean, I will say AI, they're starting to put more of these microcontrollers and micro, these AI engines, which are just extreme fast math engines into chips themselves. I mean, the pixel has that with their tensor chip, which is cool. You can do a lot of really cool stuff on your device. So I see a lot more. I don't want to call it edge computing, but I see a lot more local computing of these types of things. I mean, your phone can do all this crazy pattern matching and recognition in your camera app. You can do that and turn that into other types of stuff as well. And so I see a lot of, a lot more computing happening in devices, which is cool yeah. because we're running at really low power because Linux runs really low power. We give it all to the user to do things and it can do some really neat stuff that way. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've, I've loved the, uh, the tensile chip in this thing and all the, yeah. the capabilities it produces. And I, I've, I very much like the idea that when I'm using an AI capability, it's running locally rather than in the cloud. I think that, that makes me feel more confident using the device, if anything. Yeah. Uh, some interesting thing is they're, they're dividing up Linux. So Linux is now running multiple times on the same device. So they want to carve that out so that. One program can't steal that AI model from another program because you're running in another virtual machine. So we're seeing more and more use of instead of applications running on top of Linux, Linux being, um, I don't want to say a unikernel, but it's Linux and an application talking to Linux on an application, talking to Linux on an application um, to get a little more security boundary. So we're seeing increased security that way. They have to use these chips for something and they're providing much more better and harder security boundaries that way. Which is cool. Right. So that way you can't have some random, you can't have TikTok stealing your banking application or your pictures. You know, that's a goal. That's a good thing to have. So, I, I, you know, I've, I've, in the uh, user chat or the viewer chat here, I get people begging us not to talk about AI because it's so boring. <laughs> uh, and and the, the person who said that would like to know what work you're doing to make Linux run faster on the new Apple chips. Uh, how, how is that going? 
Um, I'm not doing any of that work. Um, there's some other people that are doing really good. Um, I mean, Apple chip is just yet another CPU, right? Um, that they don't give us the, process, the specs for. People love reverse engineering it, then the engineers doing that are doing an amazing job. And that's cool and more power to them. I'm using stuff that people actually document. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'm, I see their patches. Cool stuff is they're writing some of the drivers in Rust, and they're hitting all the issues that we thought they'd be hitting when it comes to using kernel work in Rust. Um, it was just fun to watch the community come to grips with a lot of this stuff. Um, but it's, it's uh, interesting. It's, it's good seeing that. Uh, how about gaming? You know, we, we've got a bunch of people here who are, are, are very excited by what uh, Steam is doing on top of Linux. Uh, does does that does that float your boat? <laughs> there it is. I mean, Valve. I, I've known these guys for a long time. I used to visit them when I lived in Seattle. They're good. Um, they do really good stuff. I mean, this little Steam Deck is the most amazing thing I've seen in a long time. Um, I, you can run Windows games on this thing. Um, the engineering and the work that these guys have put into this thing is absolutely amazing, and I'm blown away by it. Especially the price. I highly recommend everybody getting this thing. Um, I went through customs last week in, in France and they dug through my bag like they always do and pulled this thing out and the, the guy said, yo, this is nice. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, that's unusual for, somebody, for, the, for the security people, especially in France, to show emotions. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's a great, I mean, I, I will call out Steam. What Steam has done is amazing. And um, it's an ecosystem that they've done, but the layers and emulation, the Wine developers, the Proton developers, it's the graphics guys. They've done a really good job. And Steam has um, backed all this stuff. They're doing wonderful. I, I'm amazed at it, and I'm very happy to see them succeed. And again, strongly recommend. I'm not involved at all with them, but <laughs> it's cheap. I mean, the, the the price of this thing is so so cheap and worth it. And my son got one actually before me somehow, and um, he loves the thing too. Yeah, I'm very concerned that my daughter might be watching actually because I know what she wants for her birthday in July. And you might just have to get that expensive from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing runs everything. I mean, I don't know of any games that doesn't run. There are some odd ones that it's like, oh, this is really a weird. But then I just plug it into a dock and I throw it on my monitor and you can play other things on that. Quite. Some people use it as a laptop and other things, which I think is a little ridiculous. But the processor in here is interesting. The, the GPU in there, I, I'll call out AMD for doing a really, really good job in the community and Valve pushing them to do this work to get this kernel work and this driver work upstream. And it's all open source and they're doing a really good job. And that's how companies can get this stuff working in a way that makes them succeed. I'm, I'm really, really pleased with them. It's a success story as far as a community-based goes. Hopefully it's a commercial success for them. Yeah, well, I'm very, very impressed. I'm also very impressed they're running a business that is doing gaming without getting into the cutthroat waste of money of developing games. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're busy providing a surface for you to leverage other people's investment and their business is I mean, all Valve around being always, technically clever. Yeah, Valve has been that way a long time. I mean, they understand um, there are also a bunch of ex-Microsoft people there and that know, really know their stuff. They're really, really good engineers. Um, they know how to also work on creating an ecosystem and a developer ecosystem and a community and supporting other people because you don't know what other people are going to do. And that seems in their ethos. I mean, they take a cut of it like it from any other store that takes a cut, but um, right. they seem to be doing pretty good. I'm, I'm now, I heard sure. you mention Rust in passing there. So, you know, is, is Rust a good thing for developing on the kernel? Uh, you seem to suggest that there may be some issues. So Rust is in there. It's in the kernel. We have the basic framework. You can write a hello world driver in the kernel. Um, that's the simple part. The hard part is going to be actually doing something that works. Um, people said, oh, it's just a driver. It's not going to be easy. It's a standalone. It's a leaf. But I mean, if you think of a tree, a leaf is at the top of a tree. It depends on everything, the tree, the branches, the trunks, the roots, and it interacts with them in a way. So these drivers have to get bindings and ways to talk to the rest of the kernel. And the interaction between the kernel, the C code has its own idea of memory management and ownership and lifetime rules. And the Rust idea of ownership and lifetime rules and whatnot, that intersection there is, <laughs> it's, it's tricky. It's tricky to get right. They're doing a great job in getting it right. They're proposing a lot of good stuff, but um, doing that is hard. It's hard engineering work, um, but they're getting there. It's not gonna solve the world tomorrow. 
Um, but it's nice to see that they're trying and trying something interesting. And it's so far as seems to be working. Um, there's some direct comparisons, like somebody wrote a driver in Linux and driver C and driver in Rust and tried to compare them. And it seemed pretty easy. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it works over time because the trick of the kernel is in Linux, it evolves, right? We change its APIs. We change how it works. We change its interfaces. And if me as a C developer have to, change the interface and then it's going to cross that rust cross that rust boundary i better know enough rust to make the changes and cross the rust boundary and fix all that up there um that's going to be some just basic engineering and community building and interaction issues over time we're seeing some pushback from some subsystems saying i don't want rust bindings for my subsystem right now because i got all the work i can do right now just keeping the c code alive um interesting to see if all the companies that are supporting this We'll actually pony up and give the developers allow them to do this work which in the end if they want to see rust in there and rust supported they need to do the work so. we have a so question we, here uh, go, go ahead simon no, I was, I'm, okay. I'm heading in a completely different direction you do that question i see it okay it's, uh, it's a um it's from jonathan who was on the show last time uh will the kernel ever have a stable api and then adding adding regression testing question mark so I wrote stable API nonsense about 20 years ago. It's in the kernel if you want to read it. You don't want the kernel to have a stable API. It'll kill Linux. Um, our stable API is out between user space and the kernel. We guarantee that. We've said we will never break it, et cetera, et cetera. We, that's our one rule. You can't break that without anybody noticing it. If you break it and nobody notices it, it really wasn't being used. That's fine. Um, that's our API. Internally, no. And you don't want us to. I lay out why you will want us to do. If you wanted us to have a stable API, what, 20 years ago, we'd be stuck with that. We would have <laughs> failed. You know, even Windows changes their API all the time. Uh, if an operating system isn't, it's dead. Um, I'll say that. So um, what was the other one? Oh, regressions. Actually, we have somebody sponsored and is being paid to track regressions. And Thorsten is doing a wonderful job with that, beating on all the maintainers saying, hey, here's a regression. Here's a list of them, when they're fixed, when they're not fixed, pushing changes to Linus saying, hey, this was a regression, this subsystem that was over here, the maintainer hadn't picked it up yet, take it and let's go. He's doing a wonderful job with that. He's been doing that for a little bit over a year now. Um, total success story. Um, he always needs more help. I'm seeing some now um, interns from some of the Linux Foundation projects starting to help him out with just tracking things down and doing, but regressions are key. And um, we have a database of it. You can look them up. You can see all the regressions that are currently there, their status of them. If you have a regression, report it, and he'll track them. That's the best thing that we ever have asked for. So it's doing better. So uh, you you used to be at SUSE, and um, you know I'm, I've been watching uh, Red Hat uh, busy becoming IBM over the last month. Um, uh, the, the 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 landscape has really changed. For uh, you know the the ordinary user of a computer thinks of Red Hat when they think of Linux. I think. Uh, what do you think is, is, do you think it's good what's happening there? Do you think this is a, a natural part of growing up that we're seeing SUSE becoming basically a, a, a corporate entity and Red Hat laying off all of its community people? Do you think that's a natural evolution or do you think that that's a crisis? Well, I also, I was at IBM before SUSE, so I've, I've yes, seen both yes. sides of it. Um, I mean, I, Red Hat would love for you to say that uh, they think their marketing department says Red Hat, Linux is Red Hat. You know, that's, that was their goal. SUSE's goal is for Europe. No, Linux is SUSE. Um, but I mean, one thing that, that the distros have to contend with is people just want to solve a problem, right? And if you want to use a Linux distribution to solve your problem, wonderful. If you want to buy a box with a distribution on it and get it commercially supported, SUSE and Red Hat or IBM is there to do that for you. IBM has been in the software support business for forever. That's where they make their money. Um, so that makes sense. SUSE has been in that business for 25, 30 years now. That's where they make their money. That's a good business to be in. It's not a huge business. The majority of the world actually by far runs Android. Take all the Android stuff out of it. Everything else around the error. Majority runs Debian and the world cloud systems run Debian. Over 70%. It's, it's insane what Debian, what the world runs in Debian. Um, and Debian's a great distribution and solid and there. But if you look at, if you want to solve a problem, you go rent yourself a cloud computer, 
throw a free distribution on there or a distribution from that cloud provider. I mean, Google, Amazon, um, they all provide you a free version of Linux for their Oracle does as well for their cloud because they don't want you to have to pay any extra money. Um, anyway, you go from there. So you solve your own problems. Um, is the enterprise distribution business has always been a small business. Um, it's interesting thing to see if you can hold on to that, but it's still probably the same about size that it always has been, but just the other size is so much bigger. I mean, even Microsoft has said they're not making as much from the enterprise cloud on Windows as they are on Linux. So, right. But, but I mean, I, you know, I was very disturbed to see um, the, the uh, head of Fedora being laid off by Red Hat. Uh, and also to see so many of the community people being laid off from the OSPO and to see opensource.com being shut down. Um, you, you know, do, do you, do you think we've, 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 we've seen, we, this is now the end of the era for community open source in companies like Red Hat and SUSE and IBM? No, I do not think that. I mean, companies, open source community, open source program groups and com companies are getting bigger and bigger and there's more and more of them forming. I think you're going to see it spread out to more and more companies. I mean, look at the big giant industrial companies, Philips, Siemens, Bosch, they have open source development group. They have developers on there working on open source projects in the community, right? So these are, it's just spreading out to be more and more. Um, the Linux Foundation posted something saying job prospects of open source developers are even higher now than they ever have been. Um, yes, it's always sad to see companies lay people off. I do not understand those business decisions. I'm not in that type of work. Um, I think I do know a number of people who were laid off and got a job instantly afterwards. So if you have the skills, I worry for the new graduates coming out. My son's in university and he's, his friends and peers are worried about that. And I mean, as someone who grew up in, in out of college in one of the major recessions in the world, I've been there, seen the dot com boom, booms and busts. Um, Good skills of developers are highly needed and whatnot. And companies realize it's cheaper and faster to work in the community and use open source tools than ever before. So I was at the open source, um, the cloud conference in, Am in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago, and there was 10,000 people there. It was insane. I was like, well, I guess this Linux thing is actually going to succeed. Um, <laughs> So, so what so, what should we be telling our you know uh, f f what should we be telling our kids to focus on uh, if they're going to head into software now? Uh, my son so, I mean, focused on web, web, web programming. For, okay, so, I mean, so what have you told what, what have you told him to go do? Because we should all do that. I mean, I would say systems level work because that's what I, that's the level I work at, right? I see all these hardware companies trying to solve problems and they are all companies using software now. Web development, everybody needs a web developer and stuff like that. That's also a great skill. But I mean, the generic skill of programming, of breaking a problem down into smaller pieces and applying that to a language, no matter what the language is, that's the skill to learn how to debug, how to handle these types of data structures, how to solve a problem. And then you can get a job in any language doing any types of things. But there's so much, so many jobs out there. I mean, just take music, for instance, like all these electronics companies are now all their guitars and all these amplifiers. Everything is all software now. It's, there's tons and tons of speakers. All the speakers are all software now. I mean, Doc's favorite company, Sonos, has been running Linux for <laughs> what, 20 years now. That's all Linux and the software heavy stuff. And that's now in all speakers. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of software jobs out there for a lot of industries that never had it before. Uh, my little amplifier here that I get has software and firmware running a USB stack, handling the signals and whatnot. It's not running Linux, but it's running other operating systems. Zephyr, open, Zephyr is a wonderful little open operating system that's tinier than Linux that I'd recommend people using. Um, so that, yeah. But just the basic skills of programming. I mean, as a parent, your job is to, hopefully impart skills onto your child that they can be successful and stand on their own. Right. Uh, so give them a skill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a couple of questions. What, one of them is, um, do you have any, well, there's a, a smile with it, but uh, do you have opinions on Wayland versus Korg? Exorg. Xorg, Xorg, I'm well, sorry. Xorg's dead. Yeah. I mean, that's not an opinion. All the developers have left. I, I've actually deleted code out of Xorg. Um, yeah, I mean, that's not, a, it's not an opinion. It's just that X, Wayland does not work on NVIDIA because NVIDIA doesn't want to do the work and they haven't wanted to do the work for 20 years. 
So just don't buy their hardware. I mean, it's as simple as that. So if you want to run NVIDIA hardware, then you're kind of stuck with this weird mess. And yeah, Wayland doesn't work so well, but I mean, Wayland's been working for me for decades, um, a decade now or so. And there's no XOR developers. All the XOR developers are working on Wayland. So why is this even an argument? I don't know. I shouldn't be. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's more, more on uh, ChatGPT. All abandon all hope. He, he, Learn to code ChatGPT has become Shiva, the destroyer of code monkeys. There, I, 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 I think. Am I wrong in assuming that this isn't going to do anything? People who want to learn code are going to learn to code. It's just going to happen, and we're always going to need that. We don't. We don't. You got to know it in order to look at the the code that, that the ChatGPT comes up with and see where it sucks or doesn't work. Sure. You have to see if it's right and how to even run it or debug it, right? How is it even working to debug? I mean, ChatGPT is great for spitting out frameworks of languages and stuff that has to do a lot of frameworks like Java. It might be great for turning out things, common patterns in Java, but you still, I mean, programmer, there's been the goal of programless, prog programmerless programming for what? 50 years now, if not more than that, marketing or managers want to be able to say, Hey, take my business logic and run this program, right? Turn into a program. You're always going to have somebody to turn that into something that'll work and debug it. Yeah, right? all, Can chat all you have to do is code? <laughs> all you have to do is specify it well enough that the computer can write the code for you. And of course, the specification that you're writing is in no way a program. No, I've been there before. There's the specification rule. Yeah, let's not go there. But, um, that's been proven to not work. Let's just say that. You know, what, what about UML all those years ago, right? Remember UML? Yeah. yeah. Draw, the little, yeah draw I, the little diagrams and the boxes and they'll spit out the code on the other end and everything will be perfect. Turns out you need a feedback I, loop, right? <laughs> AI doesn't I, I remember feedback a, loop yet. I remember a software product in the 80s called The Last One that was uh, released <laughs> in 1981 by uh, a company called DJ Systems uh, that took input from a user and generated an executable program in BASIC. Uh, and apparently that in its marketing was going to be the last software tool anyone was ever going to use. That's funny, the cool man. thing is things like, I mean, Visual Basic brought the idea of programming and control of solving your problem to a huge swath of other people, right? And that was great. I know a number of those people that turned into doing other work, but they were solving a problem that they had. ChatGPT solves a problem people have with summarizing text or looking things up or writing a flyer for your birthday party. I mean, that's great. That's a cool tool. Wonderful. Is it going to become sentient and take over the world? That's again, like Doc said, where's the middle step there? I don't know. It's, it's funny when I was, uh, when I first moved to Palo Alto in 1985, my landlord was a guy who worked for Lockheed and he was an antenna scientist. And he said to me, it was getting boring because Antenna science was completed. It was a done science. We <laughs> knew it all. <laughs> and, and, and I, I kind of believe them because I came out of radio and I, I know antennas. I understood it pretty well. I, I, and I made them. You know, well, that's an interesting industry that the whole idea of genetic algorithms has proven to be wrong. I mean, they have genetic algorithms. Once you have that feedback loop of, is this better than that? And you can model it in software. You create antennas that look like nothing the antennas you used to see, but work even better today, right? Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is, cool too, that, that, I mean, the, the frequencies that carry data best are, are so high that all the antennas are small. And you don't see them. You know, yeah. for the most part, you know, there's a little nub on the top of your car. That's it. That's listening to satellite. I think. I think even with the, that nub up on the top of the car is built in this weird contorted way that you never would have been able to imagine. I mean, the antennas. If you ever taken a cell phone apart, the way that you know that winds around the circuit board in this certain crazy way, it's designed that yeah. way for a reason. And or it's part to, of the case. That's another yeah. one. You know, it's the. Yeah. And, and it knows if your hand is on it and is using another one or something like that. Yeah, you have to do that. So, so yeah, so the idea of programming is a dead, well, I think it's okay that my so, son is going into that business. So we're getting toward the end here. We're not there yet. I mean, what, what do you anticipate? I mean, how much is anticipation involved in, in your work? It seems a lot of it is reactive. Your people come in with patches, people do bug reports as you're pushing things into trees and, and are, what are you anticipating, you know, like looking forward to the next few years? 
I mean, all my work is reactive, right? It's always yeah. reactive because <laughs> we don't. So, I mean, interesting thing is we don't deal with high minded ideas. Like somebody can't come to say us and say, wouldn't it be great if Linux did this? My response would be that would be like, yeah, it would be cool. Go out and try it and I'll review your attempt that works, right? Um, yeah. Because I don't have the time to do anything else. But and the idea that you have to prove something that actually works in order for us to accept it is a good thing because um, we don't go off in odd, crazy directions and we're able to see and pick from the technologies that work. So I see the hardware lines because you see your hardware roadmaps and CPU roadmaps that are out stretching out into the future. So I see these goals of these hardware companies and what they want to do. And again, it's more, more cores, less power, more interconnects. And then on the server side, crazy number of interconnects, memory on, on a system over there that's migrating to a system over here. It's all through fast interconnects and there's all sorts of insane networking things happening. So I see that, you know, the constant evolution of tinier, faster and accommodating our code to handle that. I mean, networking stack is famous for you only have so many microseconds or milliseconds to handle this packet before you have to get the next one and taking those ideas to other parts of the kernel, like storage IO, because now your storage is on a bus that that fast as your old network used to be and transfer that into another idea of how does that handle other types of buses and other types of things in the system in order to be able to accommodate that. Um, that's the things I see in finding areas that need to be work. I mean, the cool thing about Linux is, the core data structures and infrastructure of the kernel get rewritten all the time. Linus rewrote the locking subsystem a couple years ago or so. Um, no other operating system would ever do that. You can never get a manager to sign off on that. Um, <laughs> so we're adapting to the world of what's coming, right? Or what's there. Cause we see the, we see the hardware that's coming out tomorrow per se. Yeah. We see the patches that are coming out tomorrow. We're just trying to make sure I mean, my goal is have Linux work on all pieces of hardware make sure that keeps working and happening. And then the CPU guys are making sure it runs on all the different types of CPUs. And we meet with the CPU companies and see their roadmaps. And they give us heads up of what's coming. And we say, no, that's going to be crazy. And they're like, yeah, we know it's crazy, but the hardware guys did it. So now we have to make it work. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> um, we see that happen a lot. <laughs> I, I want to ask, a, 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 since you brought up Linus, um, you know, I, I look, I was just looking at the, at the, a kernel mailing list, which I do from time to time. Um, and I see Linus is all over it. I mean, he's still top dog, obviously, I think. And that doesn't, I mean, obviously it scales. It, is, it scales as long as he's in charge. I mean, I, I, I gather you don't think about that this much and there are other people who can start to step into his shoes. I'm just wondering where, where this goes. If he gets hit by a bus tomorrow, what does it make, make much difference? Uh, the, best, the best question. No, that's only been coming up for the past twenty. I know years, it's been right? coming up for the last twenty years, but I, I I'm personally you know Linus's more answer to that, right? Before, so yeah, you know Linus's <laughs> answer, right? To that, you asked him. You've asked him that. Before. Yeah, I've, I've asked him before. He says somebody else has stepped in, basically. Yeah, he's that, like, I don't care. I'm dead, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, kernel development is a process of trusting other people, right? I trust 10 people, Linus trusts 10 people. We scale down the thing that we trust that they're going to be there to fix the problem when they, when they um, mess up, because we all mess up. Um, and that's the whole way Linux kernel development works. We have 44,000 people that how, somehow we trust in different ways. Um, yes, we've talked about this on what happens if Linus gets hit by a bus or I get hit by a bus or anybody gets hit by a bus. Uh, kernel, kernel developers, we have a plan. We know we'll handle it. We all have backups. We all have, um, other people have access to our trees. I have somebody who help can get access to my trees. There's a number, um, a short number of people that can have access to Linus's trees. Um, we can, we have ideas and how to handle this if it, if something were to happen. So don't worry about it. I, 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 where I'm going with this a little bit and just in my own head is, how much of this is a model for civilization done well enough, if not right? Because it's never right, right? We're, we're always working things out. I mean, this is part of being human. We're, we're learning animals. We're, we're changing all the time. You know, we're, we're not, we're not finished. Like what you said earlier about, you don't want a stable API because yeah. it, it's not yeah, right. I mean, that's the only thing, if we stop changing, we're dead. You know, if you stop evolving, you're dead. Um, I don't know about, 
a model for a society. It's a model to solve a specific problem very well. Because I mean, we have 4,000 people. We do not agree on everything. We don't get along even in some things, but we all agree that we want to solve the problem to make Linux better. That's about all we can agree on. We barely agree on the license at times, <laughs> the specific <laughs> nuances of the license, um, specific technical versions of things like that. That's, I mean, we are, can all agree on this one little tiny thing and we all work to make that better, the best that we can. Um, because it, and it's nice that companies pay us to do that because it solves companies' problems for them in a cheap way. You can use Linux because it's free and it actually saves you money um, than if you were to ever do it yourself, if you do it right. So. It's a good model to solving, I think, technical problems. Maybe if you, I wouldn't say it's a good model to solve anything dealing with people problems because people and interactions with people are much, much different and much more complex and much more just difficult, like I said. Yeah, I forget who said it, but it might have been Sartre, is that hell is other people. <laughs> so there's, yeah. This yeah, it's like uh, the phrase people are people. It's like, yeah, people suck. <laughs> so, I mean, we all suck. It's, it's just that's the nature of human behavior. And we're all big squishy bags of water and we can't control them. And we have feelings and emotions and <laughs> hormones. And I mean, that's what makes life interesting and good. And I think that's a <laughs> wonderful thing to do. But solving a cool technical problem is about all we can agree on on this. And it works well. So we're, yeah. we're pretty lucky that way. And Linus does a great job. But also, the cool thing about Linus and hopefully all the other kernel developers and me is you can convince them that they are wrong and they'll change their mind. And that wow. happens numerous times. And that's a rare thing. And somebody who's expressing good leadership skills that way. Um, I know people who have worked for other companies for other operating systems whose managers could never change their mind. And so they left and now they work on Linux. Um, so um, I think that's one reason Linux has seeded so well. And Linus does a really good job in that is because we are open to new ideas and change and grow and continue to allow to do this. And the cool thing is we can do this unencumbered by a whole lot of politics and managerial issues because we're interacting on a personal basis, not on a company basis. And um, that enables yeah. us to solve this problem in a very unique way. It's it's pretty cool that, that's happened. But it's also spread. I mean, look at Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a good success story for taking the idea of how the kernel was developed. I helped work with those developers on setting up their model and whatnot and succeeded in a totally different technical space. But again, thousands of developers, huge numbers of companies using it, solving a cool problem in a very complex area very well. Those guys are doing great. And that's women. great. And and we actually are out of time now. <laughs> At the the channel, wrap when ready. I think we're ready. Um, so uh, we always close with the question we asked you before: what what your favorite text editor and scripting language are? So you just repeat yourself on that, or maybe it's changed since we talked last. Uh, text editor still vi vim or vim, and then yeah. scripting language I I still use Bash. I mean I I'll drop down to Perl as my other favorite, but I'm being forced to learn Python because the kernel.org webmaster and who does all our tools for infrastructure writes Python and sometimes you have to help them out or I have to try and add new features. So I'm learning yeah. Python finally. Well, that's great. All right. Well, Greg, it's been great having you back on the show. We'll have to have you back again as always. Yeah. And uh, thanks for all you, all you do. This has been fantastic. Thanks for having me. And you guys do a great job, job too. <laughs> and good luck, Simon, in Europe. If you need any help in Brussels, I'm a short trainer. Yeah, you guys may have to team up. <laughs> Versus the bureaucrats. Well, Simon, that was cool. That was great. Could, we can the conversation can roam in many directions when you're dealing with uh, folk who are uh, at the centre of things. It's the uh, the that old saying, um, uh, 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 Captain, we are surrounded, and the answer is fantastic. We can attack in any direction, and. Um, <laughs> that, that's really how it is when you're talking with folk like like Greg, uh, who can see attacks coming in from every direction. Yeah, there's. Um, I, I'm actually in this conversation. I'm really, I'm almost for the first time really missing writing for Linux Journal because because Linux is continuing to evolve, even though Linux Journal, you know, I guess it's still there. All hail to them. They whoever's running it now has kept it alive. So everything we've written that was published is still going back to 1994 is still there. So that's cool. I, um, you know, one of my big awful discoveries for all of us is that we thought the internet was, a, the web was a library and it turns out to have been a whiteboard. So that's a, 
that's been an issue for me because I, wa- I want it to be a library. Um, but there it is. Anyway, well, but this has been a great show. Mm-hmm. So what do you, what uh, do you well, want to plug, man? I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty plug free this week. Uh, I, I just <laughs> encourage people to, to keep on supporting your, your favorite organization that's intervening on your behalf with legislators. Uh, at the moment, I, I would suggest that people might want to join OSI. Um, uh, so I'm working for OSI. They're, they're paying for my time in Brussels because nobody would do that stuff. Uh, uh, unless somebody was at least paying their tra- transport fees. And uh, if you join OSI as a member by going to opensource.org slash join, um, they will have more money that they can spend on making sure you're rep- represented in Washington, D.C., where my colleague Deb Bryant is doing the work, or in Brussels, where I'm doing the work. So do please become an OSI member today. Yeah, support and, these people. Uh, put your weight behind us. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Simon. Um, and uh, I have a small plug, I think. There's a thing called D-Webcamp. Just look it up, D-Webcamp. I'll be going to that in June. I wasn't going to be, and now I am. So, and I'll be saying stuff there. So that's, that'll be fun. So um, next week, let me look at my thing here. Um, I have to, I, I, I always, Tim Bonneman, I think is it. And I'll go back here. And yes, it is. Tim Bonneman of Open Source Science is going to be our guest next week. So come back for that. Until then, have a good time. I'm Doc Searles. This is Lost Weekly. See you then. Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the internet, a bunch of game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. You already knew all that. What you may not know is that TwitNow has a show dedicated to it, the Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, man, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. Hope to see you there.